So thanks everybody for joining us to talk about ATO. But first, the most logical question I have to ask at an AppSec event is, how many people here know somebody in their family or a friend that has diabetes? Right? So it's a pretty large segment of users. So I actually started my career uh, in health and biomedical innovation, helping combat diabetes. So it was actually an early research project that was looking for new means and methods to detect diabetes before traditional methods could do that. And it was also a non-invasive approach. So this was an approach that didn't require taking blood samples and these other methods. And what we actually built out was this um, process where we would actually have uh, a patient come into the clinic and they would have a camera on one eye and then with their other eye, they would actually be looking at this interactive mapping chart. And what it would do is, as the user uh, would follow this chart, we we're actually recording their eye with this 500 times magnification camera. And it would actually let us get access to this, uh, kind of these nerves at the back of the eye. And what we actually designed was the system that let us map out these nerves. So it wasn't just, we see like these small pieces, I actually let them build this system that we could actually chart the entire nerve plexus of the back of the eye. And this technology uh, was kind of a cornerstone to the seven year study that's still underway today. And this is kind of where my background started uh, with uh, a piece of technology called MATLAB. Has anyone here heard of MATLAB or used MATLAB? Right, it's awful software for those who've used it, perhaps could agree. Let me move my mouse out of the way, as attractive as that is. Um, and what we would use it for was actually to stitch these images together. So my background comes from image stitching techniques. This is kind of uh, what it looks like to have, so, so this is actually my eye. This is what a healthy eye looks like. So it's kind of this whirl complex that forms in a healthy eye and all the nerves kind of come to, come to this one central location. So this is what a person without diabetes, as far as I'm aware, um, looks like. This is what a patient with diabetes looks like. And this is two years before traditional methods would even pick up that this patient actually has diabetes, right? So this is really cool stuff. Um, so I wrote a paper on this and did a, a lot of work with this research institution. This was actually a research institution in Australia, where I'm from. You may have noticed the mild accent. And, uh, you know, obviously the next clear progressional action in my career would be to go on to become a doctor, right? That's what makes sense, given this. Well, no, of course not. I'm here talking to you about security. So I didn't do that. So what I did was, instead of becoming a doctor, I went on to build games, obviously. Uh, so this is me, well, is this me? <laughs> Unclear. This is me when I was five. Um, so what I actually designed uh, at the university that I was working with was a piece of technology that used uh, some of the similar image reading techniques that I pioneered with this study to track uh, people. So we were actually partnered with a small company called Microsoft on a piece of technology called the Connect. Has anyone here heard of the Connect? What does the Connect do, young sir? Yeah, so it's a, it's a piece of technology. And did you play any fun games? What was your favorite game? You have played no fun games with the Kinect. So this is the problem. This is why the Kinect is not around anymore, right? This is the kind of user reviews they would get from the Kinect. It's terrible technology. Um, we actually were one of the first to use it for a commercial means, as a, not, not actually building Xbox games, but actually building uh, what it was, was an interactive system. So we had this, this floor surface that we would project a screen onto, and we would use the Connect to actually determine where the user was standing on this, this floor area. And it would actually let us build this giant multi-touch, multi-user, effectively an iPad that was two by three meters. And this was a low cost system, and we built a whole range of educational applications with this technology. We first built it using this technology, which is built by a, com a company called PrimeSense. None of you have probably heard of the company PrimeSense. Who here owns an iPhone, or an iPhone 10 specifically? So, do you use Face ID? Don't use Face ID. Is it because you're in security, and you're like, don't want Apple to see my face? What's the reason? I want to understand. I just don't like the idea of somebody scanning my face. Do you, has a pin on it? Okay, it's all kind of old school, but I guess. All right, okay, that's fine. 
other user reviews. So this technology wasn't going places. But this, this company, PrimeSense, uh, three months into our relationship with them, they actually got acquired by Apple. This was five years ago almost now, maybe a bit longer. And that technology is actually the camera that is used in the iPhone 10. They basically went silent for many years while they were miniaturizing the technology. It used to be like this. It used to be the same size as the Kinect. And then it became what's now inside the iPhone. So we were kind of upset about that, but we ended up getting a relationship with Microsoft instead, who actually had to rebuild the Kinect V2 from scratch because Apple then owned all the patents on, uh, on the technology they were originally using for the first Kinect, which was based on the PrimeSense technology. Fun fact. This is kind of some of the games, the applications. We had like a, a lava game, Don't Stand on Lava. Who's played that game as a kid? I'm sure someone's played this game. It's a great game, right? See? See? Good reviews on games. Better than the Kinect. We did better. Uh, we had like a dodgeball game. We had to like jump over these bombs. We had like the sheep herding game where you had to herd the right sheep into the right pen and these kind of different applications and use cases. But I'm actually not here to talk about games and diabetes, surprisingly, even though we've spent the last first entire chunk of the presentation on that topic. I'm here to talk about single request attacks, uh, specifically in the context of account takeover. So account takeover, obviously, is this interesting new problem. Who here has bought something online that's been shipped to them? Right? So what did you buy that was uh, online that you had shipped to you? Some stamps. Uh, what store did you use to purchase this? Amazon. And I'm assuming you probably stored your credit card details on Amazon. Does anyone else store their credit card details on Amazon? Well, OK, a few people. And if you don't, it's a really poor user experience once again. So you know, they kind of require that. So account takeover is this concept of someone wanting to get into your account. So they, there's something in there that's valuable to them, and they would like to get in and take that from you. That's effectively the concept of what an ATO is. And they use a whole range of methods. So they, they try and break in, they try and buy credentials, they try and figure out what your credentials are, with the entire goal of getting in and stealing something. So because you stored your credentials in Amazon, this guy is now coming for you, unfortunately. Um, he's very scary. I don't, I don't know if you can tell. He's, he's very hard to see. So this is how you solve the face ID problem. You get a mask. You wear a mask when you use Face ID. Oh, that makes sense. That's just logical. Um, so this guy, he's, he's probably, probably in this room, actually, as a security conference. He's probably here learning what we know about him. But his job is to figure out a way in and uh, illicitly do fun things with, uh, with your credentials, such as we know that if you can ATO a UPS account, people are getting in there well, actually, who here ships something with UPS? Anybody has ever shipped with UPS? Because there's more people than that. Who's actually shipped with UPS? Yeah, there we go, right? Um, so UPS is a pretty common package delivery service. If you can get into something's UPS account, the fun thing you can do is redirect packages. So what they do is they ATO UPS accounts, get in there, and then redirect your package mid-route to you, back to them, and then they sell it on third-party websites. It's a fun, uh, fun, fun vector of attack. Scraping content, you know, if they can get into your account, maybe you have a premium service with a photo website or something, they can get in there and grab all that content, <laughs> sell it through a third party website. And then the more obvious use case is making transactions. Obviously they can get in there and buy things um, and then resell them. Um, in, in the context of games, they'll buy virtual goods and then you know, sell them to third party websites. In the context of a website like Amazon, they will just simply buy a product and ship it to themselves and then resell it. So there's a lot of reasons as to why they would like to do this. Who has heard of Have I Been Pwned? So what does Have I Been Pwned do? Uh, you put in an email and it'll give you back a list of maybe where that email's been and other dumps. So this week there was a new breach. Who was on that list? I was. Yeah. So there's uh, 800,000, no, 800 million, I believe. Yeah, 800 million accounts. And this is a kind of an older leak, but have I been pointed as a website you can go to, put your email in, and it will let you know if uh, your account's been breached or leaked. And they actually leak both the email and the password. So you can actually see what password you've had lost. 
And this is obviously the starting place of someone that wants to do an ATO attack. They get access to your leaked credentials and they can then use those to go and attack and get in and start doing some of the nefarious things we described. The most common attack vector with ATO is they take all of these leaked emails and, uh, well, who sees their password on this list? <laughs> Which one's yours? Is, is it football? No, it's, it's, it's number one. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's the same, same as my luggage. Yeah. Right? So, you know. Um, Unfortunately, a very large majority of people use one of these 10 passwords. Like high, high double digits use one of these passwords. So what you do is you take people's emails and you start testing those emails on every service that you find of interest with passwords like these and also all the passwords that were leaked on those lists. There's 800 million new passwords leaked on that list that are valid passwords people use. So you can automate this process using software that goes and attempts to log in to every single service that's out there. And uh, basically, once you get some valid credentials, you can then hand that off to a human who can then go in and do their job. But you can use automated software to start this process. Does anyone here own an IoT device? Like a light bulb. What is your name, sir? Patrick. Patrick. What IoT device do you own? Raspberry Pi base. Well, that may be better or worse. Unclear. What 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 do you what what is like a good example of an IoT device you have? Uh, Alexa, Cortana. Uh, I'm pretty sure my toaster can tweet. Yep, that's probably <laughs> your light bulb can determine if it should open the door or not. Probably those kind of things. Yeah, my garage door, you know, cloud-based. Oh, of course, very very safe, very logical, totally cool. Yeah, highly recommend everybody have their garage door be. I, Huh. So these are pretty popular. There's a lot of them out there. And there's a lot of really cheap ones being made. Uh, and there's a lot of really expensive ones being made with the same quality as the cheap ones. Uh, and unfortunately, these same devices can also be ATO'd. And they're even easier to ATO because the default credentials are the same across many millions of them. There's one device we know of, which is a photo frame which has access to your Wi-Fi and therefore your internet identity. And it has the same login and password and they sold tens of millions of them. And you can just log into them anywhere you would like and do all kinds of fun things. So what we've actually seen is people route traffic through these to launch attacks. Um, and what they do is when they're launching these attacks against whatever website they're trying to ATO, they're actually proxying traffic through things like IoT devices. We've seen this ourselves. Um, and they're using this to get access to a vast number of identities, effectively a near infinite number of IP addresses they can now access. So you can't rely on IP address as a signal of, is this user bad or not? Because they'll use it just on one request, then they'll never use it again. So it's like, are they bad or not? Who knows? They just came in, tried credentials with one IP address, and then they moved on. In reality, they didn't move on, they just changed their IP address. They're still there testing other credentials. The next logical thing is, well, what about the fingerprint? How about we look at the user agent and their fonts? Well, guess what? You can change that too. It's not overly difficult. I'm sure for those of us in security, client-side data can't be trusted, right? Who would agree with that statement? <laughs> yeah, it's logical. You can't, you can't trust client-side data, you can't trust network data. Anything coming from a, an end user can't be trusted. So you can't rely on these identities either. Browsers have gotten increasingly easy to automate. Chrome released a fantastic browser that allows you to automate it. So they have a headless version of Chromium. Chromium, of course, is the source for Chrome. And this is a browser that is open source. So you can download the source of Chromium and modify things such as what user agent is this saying it does? You know, what JavaScript support does it have? Yeah, actually, we've seen attacks that do this and they're using real browsers that are modified that let them bypass security checks that the Chromium team built in because it's open source. This is the benefit of it and the negative of open source is uh, you can kind of do fun things like this. And of course, there's more legacy systems like Selenium, which is more used for automated testing. That's a bit easier to detect. And of course, PhantomJS is a bit more of an old school product. But you know, we, we see proper attacks just using Chromium nowadays. 
and just modify it in such ways that you can't determine that it's actually chromium. What about biometrics? Fingerprinting the way users interact with websites. Of course, that must be real, right? Who thinks biometrics work? To a certain extent, so you believe they do work. What, in what context? Well, it gives you the metrics, right? That there's a high false positive ratio, and you need to do a lot of tuning to get that signal to false <coughs> ratio down. But it's not the silver bullet, right? It's going to give you some threat met matri metrics, but it's not necessarily going to give you everything you need. Yeah, no, that's fair. It's, a, it's an additional signal we can look at, right? But the downside, of course, is as with all client-side telemetry, this is once again something that the attackers have control over. We've seen bots where they actually let you record using a macro feature your mouse movements as you go through a website, and then it adds randomization to your human movements. You do 1,000 recordings, your randomness is going to be better. You do five recordings, it's going to be more obvious. But there's actually built-in tools now in bots that you can buy off the shelf that do some of the other things I described that also let you randomize this signal too. So even this signal is something that bots have overcome. You can't rely on this as a true false signal of uh, automated attacks. Who here sort of recapture? Anybody heard of anybody here like recapture? So anybody that doesn't like recapture, put your hand up. Randall, do you like recapture? It's better than method. That's true. As with all things, more is always better than less. That's fair. Um, recapture, unfortunately, can be quite easily broken. So these text captures, we don't see anymore because this technology has been well and truly defeated, right? You can use optical character recognition, <coughs> which is a commercially built piece of technology. With a, I'm sure if you've added your credit card to a phone, it's asked you to take a photo to scan it in, right? Who's had that happen when you recently, yeah, like, I think like the Uber app and stuff like that, you can now just take a picture. That same technology is why this technology couldn't progress because machines were getting significantly better at the concept of associating metadata with a text image than humans were. Human solve rate was two and three. So one in three users would fail these on first attempt. Right? Machines now are 100%. So anyone that's using a text capture, it's nothing more than a glorified honeypot at best. Something is better than nothing, but yeah. in that context, you're losing users. So probably not ideal. This is a good example of capturing the credit card. So they moved on to this, this uh, photo image challenge. Has anyone seen this come up in the wild? Tell me more about your experience with this photo challenge. Some of them are fairly easy. One or two, they get a little iffy. iffy. Just a little iffy. Just a little iffy. So this is, once again, a commercial problem. Who's heard of self-driving cars? I hear it's an up-and-coming thing. I live in San Francisco. We see them around. I'm not yet convinced. It's like a around-the-corner thing, but we'll see. Self-driving cars will not become a reality until this thing is 100% bypassed. Because guess what self-driving cars have to do? They have to take photography of what's around them and associate metadata and label that data. And that's the exact same way that you break this technology. Good news for self-driving cars. Machines are really good at doing this and can pretty much 100% bypass this technology now as well. There's a piece of software you can buy called Xevil. Any Russians in the room? <laughs> no Russians? This is Russian software, of course. It's $400. It's pretty expensive. But this will 100% bypass recapture. Uh, we bought it, of course. We like to support our Russian friends uh, and tested it. And yes, it does work on every website that uses recapture. Um, so if anyone is frustrated with recapture, xevil dot something, just Google xevil. It'll come up. It might say Google unsafe when you click it. Just ignore that. What does Google know? What does Google know about that? This is a competitive product to them. They're not going to let you into that website. So that's kind of what a single request attack is, right? So here's a, a bit of a, a roadmap as we're walking through our presentation in case anyone's bored. Can anyone tell me what a single request attack is? Has anyone been paying attention? That's correct. Fantastic. Someone paying attention. Doing well in the world. So let's talk about how we automate account takeovers. Now that we have all these techniques that we know we can use to basically bypass all defenses websites are using today to combat bots, you can't rely on fingerprints, you can't rely on the identity, you can't use captures. 
So what, what have you got left? Well, not much, turns out. $10 piece of software. It's called anti-public. Has anyone heard of anti-public? No one has heard of, this is gonna be exciting. This is a Russian tool again. <laughs> this is industry leading software when it comes to ATOs, $10. <laughs> Pastebin is my favorite website for finding breaches and hacks. I'm sure some of you do research on Pastebin to make sure your websites haven't been breached or no one's sharing leaks. Uh, if you're not, I highly recommend it. This is a spam database of 458 million accounts, specifically designed and ready to go straight into anti-public. And what it is, is it's emails and passwords. Pretty simple. And what it does is it takes that list in and it uses this beautifully Russian software to go off and do some nefarious things. And it does the same single request attack stuff behind the scenes, but it does this in the context of getting into a login page. So you tell it what logins, like what login websites would you like to try and break into today? And then you feed it the list of passwords and emails that you would like to test and it will go off and do that. It will give you success rates, it will give you ratios, it gives you all kinds of great telemetry and metrics. We all, we're, we're a data-driven world, so it's great to have awesome software like this. This is the MyRes edition, by the way. I don't know what that means, but I'm sure it's important somehow. It's probably other editions, maybe there's cooler editions. They're so confident. Oh, who here gives free trials at their companies? Anyone, any companies give free trials? What does your company give free, what does your company do, sir? Hiring, and what is the free? And what is? The, and why do you give a free trial? Is it because you're confident in your in your product and your service, and you know that upon giving a free trial, users will be converted and yeah. use your product. First sample is always free. <laughs> so our good friends at AntiPublic are very generous and uh, very confident in their software. They give away free uh, five hundred free uses of their software, and you just plug in an email, and it will go off and do its thing, and be like, "Yep, here they crack this account for you. You can go log in and do whatever you want now." Uh, you don't even have to pay. And it's $10. $10. And it's still giving 500 free samples away. Hmm, mm, exactly. So I'm surprised no one's heard about this. But uh, I'm, I'm very humbled to be the first to reveal these fantastic tools. These same techniques don't just apply in the context of ATO, though. So this concept of single request attack is attacking other places. Who here flies? Did anyone fly to get here to AppSec, California? Where did you fly from? I flew from Buffalo, New York. That's a long flight. I'm from Australia. I used to fly from Australia to come here. Yeah. That's a short flight as well. Anyway, I digress. Um, was it a cheap airfare? Did you find a good deal? It was pretty cheap. That's good. How much did you pay? Fly? 300 round trip. Oh, that's pretty good, actually. Um, so, we're always looking for the best airfares, right? Who wants to pay more when you can pay less? Unless it's like a specific airline and a specific speed or something time of day. The goal is you're always gonna kind of find the cheapest fare. And that's, that's the standard, right? Like maybe if your company's paying, maybe you'll opt for a slightly nicer flight. But if you're paying, you're probably gonna pick what's the most economical flight, right? This airline uh, we work with in Hong Kong uh, had a problem where their seat inventory that they were selling, this is a low budget airline, so they're a very famous airline in Hong Kong, and uh, they're selling the seat inventory, but the seat inventory was going missing. It was just vanishing, and they were not getting, so people couldn't buy inventory from this website, right? And what was happening was, well, because they couldn't buy from this low budget airline, they were instead having to go and buy from more expensive competitive airlines. Interesting, what could have been happening? So, what the other airlines were doing was they were using automated software, doing single request attacks, going through the booking engine on Hong Kong Express's website, reserving a seat to whatever destination they would like, getting to the payment flow, so the checkout page, and then they were using a payment redirection method Alipay is the primary one, but more familiar to us is PayPal here, and, uh, here in the US. And what that would do is when you click uh, Alipay or PayPal, it takes, like who's used PayPal to buy something, right? Like it's, it's a pretty commonly used product, right? Um, when you click that option, 
it takes you off the website, it takes you to PayPal to complete the transaction. And what the airline does is, of course, it can't give you the inventory until it hears back from PayPal. So it actually holds that seat. And it just it pauses that inventory whilst it waits for the call back from PayPal. And they do that for up to 10 minutes while they're waiting for the transaction to go through. And of course, the fraudsters were not transacting. And what they were doing was perpetually locking inventory in this redirection process and completely eliminating the airline from selling any of these seats. So this is kind of a denial of service, right? Um, and what, would, what it would look like is when you go to the website to buy inventory, it looks like it's sold out for up to 14 days in advance. Every flight, every destination is eliminated. Uh, but in reality, that inventory is sitting there in this seat hold loop. So they were using single request to text through that. Does anyone know who this guy is? Who said Bieber? Why do you know that? <laughs> Have you been to one of these? You're a big fan? Are you Canadian? No. Well, that makes sense, because the Canadians hate him. Um, so I'm assuming no one's been to, except this gentleman's been to a Justin Bieber concert? No? What about uh, a small band called ACDC? We call them Akadaka in Australia. This is, this is an Australian band, for those who aren't aware, full of knowledge in this presentation. Um, has anyone been to a concert recently? No one has been to a concert recently. What concert did you go to recently? Last night, Elton John. Last night, Elton John. Where? Here? Oh. Why didn't you invite us? <laughs> <laughs> Who's tried to buy a ticket and missed out because there was no inventory available in five minutes, right? The gentleman recording, sir, what ticket did you try and buy? <laughs> well, that's... That's an abrupt end to that story. So we'll just move on. So ACDC, more importantly, they actually have Australian currency. We actually minted currency in Australia because they're so awesome, as of course you all know. Um, this, is a, this is what our 50 cent coins look like in, in Australian currency. It's worth, maybe, mm, it's worth maybe a mint at best in, in the US. The currency is not doing so, so great right now. We'll, we'll move on from that. Um, so. Ticket inventory, famous ticketing websites have told us that. This is, this, is, this is a fact. This is a fun fact. This is another fact. So many. Seat inventory today sells out in three minutes. And that's because the vast majority of inventory is being purchased by bots. If you eliminated bots, they're all doing single request attacks, right? If you eliminated bots from buying inventory, it would take six hours to sell out the same inventory, right? So if ever you're in the, in the queue and you're there in the first six hours, you would be guaranteed tickets to the best concerts in the world if they were not being bought by scalpers. And why are they doing this? Can anyone tell me why they would want to buy this inventory? That's right. So a $70 ticket, you can sell up to 5x the value of that ticket. Uh, and you make a lot of money doing this because, you know, yeah, if you really want to go to that concert, a fan will pay more money. And who's, who's actually po uh, pocketing that money? Fraudsters. It's not the ticketing company. It's not the artist. So everyone loses in this scenario except the fraudsters, and it's huge margins. Right? If you can sculpt you know, 50,000 tickets, think about the margins on that. Right? It's huge amounts of money. And that's why they're so invested in doing things like single request attacks. And they frankly just completely overcome the defenses of these ticketing companies, even though they invest huge amounts of money in this problem. That's a really hard problem. So this is the software you want to use if you uh, would like to buy tickets early, because you're not going to get them in six hours. I at least can help you get it in three minutes. It's $1,000. This is pretty pricey software. Uh, go to ticketbot.net, or you can just Google this. It'll come up. And uh, what it does is it lets you select how many threads would you like this to run on your PC so it can run you know, in parallel processing. It's the future. Uh, and you tell it what time of day you would like it to log in, what tickets you would like it to buy, and it goes off and does its thing. And behind the scenes, it's doing these single request attacks on your behalf. You can route proxies through it, all this good stuff, get access to some IoT botnets, and uh, get some cheap inventory. And then you can resell it and retire young. That's what many people do. So we're moving through. So what did we just cover? 
Yeah. One pagan's engine. So what, what are we, young sir? What did we just cover? Uh, some shit like single, single account takeovers with bots. That was the one before. <laughs> <laughs> what did we just cover? <laughs> no. <laughs> what we can do to become rich? Why is no one listening? <laughs> I'm giving you all these great things. So these these same attacks are also used in other use cases, uh, like gift cards, right? I found this on Pastebin, my favorite website. This is a very simplistic brute force attack. It's just literally JavaScript that's just randomizing numbers and then putting them into a check gift card feature. And guess what happens if you come back with a valid gift card balance on your random brute force? You now have a legitimate gift card you can go and spend, right? <coughs> Has anyone here bought a gift card before? At the back, what did you buy? What was the gift card for? This is a very different story than I was expecting, but uh, <laughs> what kind of gift cards? So like $50 Visa gift card. Okay. Yeah. But that was stuck. And then Palance was already used. Yeah. So has anyone given away a gift card for like a Christmas present or something? Yeah. Right? So how long, on average, does a gift card sit if you're going to buy it for Christmas? That's a yes, I guess, if it's a poorly given gift card present, very untargeted to the individual. <laughs> but yeah, like months, right? So typically it'd be months. So you buy this. When it's actually on the shelf, it's deactivated. So you can't, you can't get into that gift card. It doesn't, it's not activated until they go to the register and they, they pay. That's why they have to like scan it into the credit card system. You'll typically see that, right? That's when it actually connects to the service of whoever is backing the gift card, and then it's activated. From that moment until it's redeemed, that gift card can be attacked. So whilst it's sitting under the tree for months, people are using software, uh, using single request attacks with this kind of stuff on top, trying to get into those gift cards. Because once you can get in, yes, you can redeem them. And then when the person that actually owns the gift card goes to redeem it, well, it doesn't actually exist and it's not valid. So that's, that's, uh, that's a problem for them. But the fraudster is great. What about credit cards? I guess credit cards are also a potential attack, right? If you can do a single request attack on a credit card use case, who has donated to a charity online? Right? So how much money did you donate? Well, you can give me a rough number. Uh, 100 bucks. Right. OK, that's, that's too high. Stop being so generous. <laughs> so what people do is they go to charity websites, and they'll donate $1. But then they're actually using their credit card. They're trying to use someone else's credit card. You can buy credit cards on the dark web. Millions and millions of them that have been leaked. But they're not yet proven that you have valid uh, street address and validation, etc. CCV is <laughs> three digits. Guess how many times it takes to brute force that? Guess how long that takes for a computer to brute force? They've already brute forced 1,000. Um, all of the values of these credit cards can be brute forced. And this is an attack called carding, where they will uh, randomly guess the credentials to gift cards using websites such as charity websites where you can just test a dollar. Most of these websites don't have defenses against bots. So they just let you keep testing. They'll even be really generous and say, your CCD was wrong. Your street address was wrong. Try something else on this one, right? You find a website like that, you can get through a lot of credit cards. Um, and, then, and then, you know, good luck. Good luck from there. So this is a great forum. If you would like to buy stolen credit cards, I'd recommend uh, Checknet. It's a fantastic website. And this is a... Uh, an individual, a busy bee, who is looking to purchase Australian or New Zealand credit card. And this gentleman actually tells him where you can buy the credit cards from, jstash.bazaar. I believe that's a Tor website URL. I don't think I went there. Anyone know why you would want to buy a New Zealand credit card? I don't know if anyone's been to New Zealand, but they have a lot of sheep there. But if you, like, I can understand wanting to buy an Australian credit card. That makes sense. We have beautiful beaches. If I was presenting in New Zealand, I'd have to pixelate that image. Can anyone tell me how to pronounce this? Adidas. Sorry? Adidas. Adidas. It's Adidas. Nice try there. What about this one? Aluminium? <laughs> <laughs> he learned. Aluminum is such a fancy word, but all of those letters don't exist. I don't understand why that. The guy who invented the name 
and said aluminium first, and then decided it was wrong and called it aluminum. Marketing. So, That's marketing. His marketing team told him, it sounds more fancy. The Americans will love this. What about this word? Caramel sounds, it's caramel, caramel, all right? Now we've got that out of the way. So we have, um, I have a story to tell now, it's story time. Just everyone, some silence, please. So I want to tell the story about Jimmy. So Jimmy is a young child who likes to purchase very expensive shoes. But when he purchases or, or tries to log on and purchase these shoes, they're not available. And he's very upset about this. Um, he tried many things. This is Jimmy here. He tried many things. He went and lined up at a shoe store, assuming he'd get in and get the inventory in time. But he's always late. His parents don't let him out, you know, at the bright early in the morning to go and line up. So when he gets there, it's sold out. It's very upsetting. So he turned to cybercrime. <laughs> this is Jimmy attempting to use cybercrime. He's not very good at cybercrime. He is Jimmy. Poor Jimmy. He gets access denied when he tries to use you know, multiple computers at once to try and purchase. Who's done that with ticketing websites or something, right? Try, I'll get on my phone and my computer and this and that. They know that they're all you, by the way. They're really good at that. So they block that. Fortunately, Kanye West came to help him <laughs> to buy shoes, of course. And Kanye West sold to him all in one bot. This is a great website, you should go there. This, this is an actual video that they have. They built like a full high production and they hired Kanye West. It's very legitimate. And what this software does is it does single request attacks on sneaker websites and it will buy the inventory that you would like when it's available. Uh, it's $325. Um, which, you know, it's pretty decent. These shoes can go for a couple of thousand dollars. If you can automate one pair of shoes, you've got pretty good ROI, I think, on the purchase. Uh, this is uh, an individual who obviously was just like Jimmy and just wanted one pair of shoes. For some reason, he ended up with like 10 or 12 or whatever this is, 16. That well, looks like, I digress. So he clearly was not looking to buy. I, I, I think it's hilarious when like literal people committing fraud just post images to Twitter of like, I just defrauded this website. I got a whole bunch of shoes that I'm going to resell. And they even like talk about the companies that they use, like e-proxies and guru proxies, which they're using to do single request attacks through. So what this software does, you download it. It's got a very, very nice UI actually, unlike the other ones. You pick your website, including uh, Adidas, pick the shoes that you would like, and the size and the color and all these things, and then you turn it on and it goes and does its thing. They have a term actually, it's called copying. Copying is apparently, and is that like a thing here? Copying? I mean, it's not a term we have in Australia. I thought it was strange, but that may be just me. Um, and they have, you know, 60,000 cops so far, so they've got like great stats. They clearly have some kind of call home mechanism in their software, which is cool. 10,000 testimonial shout outs on Twitter. 10,000 people committing fraud talking about it on Twitter. I thought that was really, really strange. Um, this really impresses me. Three hour support time reply, like that's better than most companies, like yeah. legitimate companies, right? Like that's actual like top tier. So I think that's really cool. Uh, and they just happily talk about, you know, all of the totally legit things that this, this company helps you do. And at the end of the day, uh, for some reason, Michael Jordan will actually deliver the shoes to you. I don't know why. I guess it's some kind of resale agreement with Kanye. But anyway, Jimmy is very happy. So this is good. Does anybody know these characters? Anybody over here know these characters? Who are they? Who is this character? Pokemon. That's a very high level of who these characters are. Do you know who this character is? This funny looking yellow rabbit. That is Pikachu. Correct. Has anyone played Pokemon Go? Nobody has played Pokemon Go. That's a lie. No one's got. All right, you've played it. What level did you get to? Uh, not very high. That's p pathetic. <laughs> I'm unimpressed. Unimpressed. You've ruined my talk now. I don't know. I can't go any further with this. So the, pers the first player to max level in Pokemon Go, eh, it was a bot, of course. 
makes sense. I mean, they can play 24 seven. They can do things humans can't do. They can click things faster. They can play better. They can just keep going through and doing this sort of stuff. Pokemon Go's community were the first to defeat a piece of software called Android Safety Net. So I don't know if anyone here uses Android Safety Net to protect their properties they work for, but Android Safety Net is a piece of software that's designed to stop emulation of Android OS. So it's supposed to tell you, is this actually a real phone or is this an emulated version of the phone? Of course, people using bots want to run emulators because then they can do everything automatically at as large a scale as they would like. Much harder to do when you have to use physical phones. So of course, this feature by Google, Android Safety Net, which is a true false, if it's, is it real or not, is a fantastic feature. <coughs> Only problem is Android OS is open source, just like Chromium. So what they figured out, when they rolled it out in Pokemon Go, there's a large community of hackers. It's called Pokemon Go Dev on Reddit, if anyone would like to go to it and check it out. They were stopped momentarily from running their bots. Uh, so what they did was they reverse engineered the Android OS and made it say true <laughs> instead of false. So now they can run their Android emulation and it completely bypasses Android safety net. Because once again, you cannot trust client side information. Even if the company making the OS says you can, they're wrong. You definitely can't. And Pokemon Go has proven that. Um, does anybody know anyone in their family, or maybe it's you, who has died and voted recently? Nobody that's dead and voting in the room? <laughs> Just, nope, okay. Well, uh, so there's a thing called a death master file. It's quite morbid. It's a real thing, you can look it up later. And it leaked one year. And what this list has is a list of everyone that's passed away and their social security number and where they lived and all kinds of fun things. This is a government owned thing. It's perfect. It makes a lot of sense why the government would have this. It's just unfortunate they leaked it. So um, what people have done with this death master file is they've used it to do all kinds of fun things with bots. Because now you can effectively take over these identities of people that no one's checking on and do interesting things uh, like voting in certain polls. So this gentleman uh, found out that his mother, whom would have turned 71, but didn't turn 71 because she was dead, voted, uh, made three separate comments in support of ending net neutrality. Right? <coughs> and there's other scenarios where similar things are happening. So these websites don't validate if these users are alive or not, just that they have a valid social security number and valid other details. And bots have been using this list to do amazing things in support of all kinds of things that they would like to win. And there's a whole range of other use cases that these same attack techniques can be applied to, right? You know, auction houses, uh, buying cheap, selling high. You can basically control the economics of the market. We've seen scenarios where people are doing denial of service on auction inventory, where effectively maybe you're selling a comic book for $30 and uh, you have six other people competing, selling their comic book for $30, but suddenly yours gets bid up to $150. And, and at the end of the day, the buyer bounces, doesn't actually purchase it, but they bought one. Other people have bought the other cheaper ones. And this keeps happening to you. What they're actually doing is using software to create accounts on these websites and make false bids and actually give you effectively denial of inventory where you can't sell your inventory because they keep bidding you up more expensive than themselves and they can kind of control the price. And this is happening on major auctioning websites right now. And then there's hacking and scraping and ratings, of course, and all kinds of things you can do. Um, and I'm sure we're familiar that social websites have this concept of news that's propagated and certainly not interfered with by Russians using similar techniques like this to bypass all of those very same defenses. They don't actually have a magic bullet to solving this problem. They're in the exact same situation as all of these other companies. Right? So you can use software, single request attacks, to disseminate anything you want online. And when information online has enough people backing it and following it, it gets social proof. Right? So if you see a comment that has 200,000 likes or retweets, you're probably more likely to trust it than something that's got none. Unfortunately, bots can also like and retweet things. So you can do all kinds of fun things in that scenario. So how do we stop account takeovers? It's tricky. Obviously, we've gone through scenarios more than just ATOs. 
But one major recommendation is rate limiting by the email and the identity of the user if you can, if you have software that does that. So this means that maybe give them three attempts on an IP or on an identity. That is one thing you can do. Obviously the goal is how do we, how do we make it more expensive uh, for the attackers to use software to attack us than the value that they can theoretically extract. If you can break the economics of it by putting enough roadblocks in their way, they'll go attack somebody else. So these are the kind of techniques you want to employ to do such a thing. Lock accounts with suspicious activity. Definitely do this. Unfortunately, this is a really bad user experience because if your account gets locked and you have to contact someone at the company to unlock it, that's horrible. You might lose users because of this. But you're definitely going to lose users if they find out their credit card has been stolen from your platform. So you have to take care with this kind of balance, right? Who uses multi-factor authentication? Would you use multi-factor on a game you play versus a bank? What's more likely you would enable it on? Do you use it on everything that provides it, or just things that are more important, like banks? These days, I use it on everything that I can. Okay. So you're very generous with your time, then, because it's quite a quite an effort to uh, use multi-factor, as we all know. You have to get your phone out. Um, is it uh, token-based or SMS-based? SMS-based. Uh, well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> I have a slide just for you. SMS-based. Uh, multi-factor is breached now. So you can actually quite easily attack and get into accounts that are using SMS. So token is currently still very viable. That's probably the most secure approach to stopping ATO. So if you want to stop ATO, token-based MFA. Oh, really? When did that happen? So they've got farms that as soon as they want to log in, they wait for you to log in and send you a message at the same time. So well, on SMS. Oh, oh, this person's already clicked. On SMS, yes. But not on token. Uh, no, no, I'm actually token. doing the alerts. On oh, really? It's still man. That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah we're all screwed. So they, huh. It's actually based on phishing attack, though, not just random attack. Yeah. Right. So they have to get you. This is this is what I love about working in fraud. It's the attackers are geniuses. Yeah. Like they're smarter than we are. It's awesome. Um, it's always very interesting. And then the other thing, of course, is if they're going to be using bots and things like that to try and get into your account, if you're not using MFA, then Strong passwords are very good. Who uses LastPass or 1Password or something? Oh. Good. That's what everyone should be using. That's the best defense against ATO, right? Other than MFA. Um, have I been pointed also have an API for enterprise companies that you can actually test as users set up an account. You can test if those, and even when they're logging in, you can test if those credentials have been ever used by someone else before or if they've been leaked before. And if, of course, they're on the list, guess what? They're going to be broken like that, right? So this is a good service that you can use to, uh, to stop that problem. So that's kind of, uh, kind of what we're talking about today. So I hope you enjoyed that. I think we're pretty well over time. But uh, if anyone's interested in kind of what we do, so we're a fraud prevention company. We're backed by PayPal, and we're doing stuff with some cool companies. We work in this space, and that's why we've seen all these great things. Um, but we'll be, we'll be hanging out around front if anyone's got any questions. So, I have a question. Um, one of the things I've seen recently is sites with no passwords at all. It's purely you want to log in to the site, it sends you an email. And link. Which is fine, but it just moves the problem to where? To the email. There you go. You haven't solved the problem, you just moved yeah. the problem. It's still better having a centralized location. It's like LastPass, right? You centralize it to LastPass. They still have a login as well. So, yeah. Yeah. It's All right. All the way down. Exactly. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. Thank you.